Rebuilding the system from scratch is uh, an option, especially to eliminate any kind of attack, but it's not practical. Welcome listeners to the Industrial Security Podcast. My name is Nate Nelson. I'm here with Andrew Ginter, the Vice President of Industrial Security at Waterfall Security Solutions, who's going to be introducing the subject and guest of our show today. Andrew, how's it going? I'm very well, thank you, Nate. Our guest today is Alex Yevtushenko. He is the CEO and co-founder of Salvador Technologies, and Salvador does resilience. They do rapid recovery after an attack. So, uh, you know, we've been talking a lot about preventing, detecting, responding. This is the recovery piece of the puzzle. Then without further ado, here's your conversation with Alex. Hello, Alex, and welcome to the podcast. Before we get started, can I ask you to say a few words about your background and about the good work that you're doing at Salvador Technology? Hello, Andrew, and thank you for inviting me. I'm Alex, CEO and co-founder of Salvador Technologies. I'm coming from electrical engineering back background with a lot of experience in software development, more than 10 years and more five years in the R&D field, more technological and a bit of business part. My goal was to establish the R&D department in the company I worked for and they bring, I, I brought dozens of product uh, from the idea to the market. Uh, Salvador Technology established three years ago by me and my uh, uh, co-founder Oleg Vusiker, uh, who is also a good friend of mine. Uh, Oleg coming from a national cybersecurity unit in the IDF with more than 10 years experience uh, in cyber. Uh, my cyber background is uh, was always background to uh, my daily uh, job. So together we established Salvador. Uh, w- what we are doing in Salvador is providing fastest and most complete recovery solution for cyber attacks. We actually redefined the cyber resilience for ICS and OT organizations. You mentioned resilience. Our topic is resilience for industrial operations. I mean, the textbook definition of resilience is like uh, a spring. You you deform something, you put it under pressure, it changes, and then it comes back. Um, that's a textbook definition. You know, in the industrial cybersecurity space, to you, what is resilience? What does that mean? Uh, okay, uh, f- first of all, I like the definition you you mentioned uh, and uh, uh, i i think the re- recovery uh, in the real life is a, a bit similar to what you determined it's re- resilience actually goes beyond definition of preventing breach uh, resilience it uh, make proactive measures to regain the operations once attack uh, occurs uh, and uh, in terms of recovery, it means have robust recovery solution to ensure the organiza- organizations continue the operations as it was before. Uh, like you mentioned this, this spring, uh, the organization should minimize the impact of the downtime and uh, swiftly restore all the operations uh, and all the processes. Uh, for example, imagine a ransomware hit a manufacturing facility as it goes down, all the HMI stopped, uh, the machines are down. Uh, it can be days or even weeks. The average time is 20 days of downtime for this sector. Uh, and now imagine you can click a button and go back within seconds to the stage before the attack. No downtime, no impact on the organization, exactly like a spring. Okay, so so coming back to, you know, the in a sense, the magic button, um, recovery is something that, you know, we have not had a lot of, of guests on the show talk about, you know, the NIST framework is govern, identify, protect, detect, respond, recover. We've had a lot of people actually talking about detection, 
and to some extent response, not so much recovery. I mean, in my understanding, there's at least two ways to recover an industrial system after it's been compromised. You can rebuild from original known good media, you know, rebuilding the whole system from scratch, if you like, um, reapplying any changes that you've made over time. You can restore from backups, but, you know, that can get tricky as well. Are your backups synchronized? Do you have one from three months ago before you made a bunch of changes and another system from right now, and you don't have one on the other system from three months ago? The whole question of recovery seems complicated. And indeed, rebuilding the system from scratch is uh, an option, especially to eliminate any kind of attack, but it's not practical. So let's not discuss this one. Uh, But for the second part of the question, Backups are an an important part uh, for uh, resilience. Uh, The thing is, the backups used today are more IT centric, uh, centered, uh, IT focused. Uh, They are focused on the data, uh, many required cloud connection or internet connection, or always online that. Uh, are accessible to the internet, accessible to the attacker that can easily penetrate and destroy the backups. Uh, Another part of backups uh, that are a bit more protected uh, and a bit more better, let's say, is uh, managing manual backups of the system. Actually taking USB drive from system to system to take a snapshot, take an image, and uh, place it to a safe uh, location. Uh, And this is very long process and not efficient process. And this is all why the recovery takes so long. An average of 20 days, about three weeks to recover a facility from ransomware attack. And this is the problem we need to solve. Nate, let me jump in with a, a couple of concrete examples. I mean, the, the sort of textbook high-profile case was Colonial. Um, they took something like five and a half, six days to recover their IT network after ransomware hit it. Um, you know, to my knowledge in the public reports, ransomware did not get into their OT network. So they they didn't have to do anything on the OT side, but just the IT side took them five, six days. Um, I mean, they paid the ransom. They got the decryption tool. You know, they were hoping that that decryption tool would uh, solve the problem faster than restoring from backup. It didn't. They went back to restoring from backup. And this was an IT infrastructure. You know, I don't know if they had cloud backups. I don't know if they had what kind of backup systems they had, but, you know, even an IT infrastructure where you have all of the world's technology at your fingertips, internet-based or not, took you know five and a half, six days. And I've heard stories on the OT side of things taking much, much longer than that, weeks and sometimes months. Um, so, and, and you know, uh, he mentioned as well, um, you know, the possibility of manual backups. Um, if you don't have a lot of infrastructure, you know, what he didn't mention is what I worry about with manual backups. You know, if you've got an automated system, you get an alarm if a backup fails. If you're doing it manually and you forget a system or three, there's no alarms. It's it's error prone is, is what I worry about. Another concern that I would have, and it's possible that you guys address later in the interview, is that, you know, the obvious solution to the most common, at least the most dramatic attacks today, ransomware is extortion, uh, is having those backups ready and able. Um, But, of course, attackers know this. And I'm not sure if this is a relatively new trend or if they've been doing it forever, but I've heard of cases where ransomware actors specifically target those backups to remove the leverage that you have over them. Absolutely. And, and, you know, he glossed, didn't gloss over it. He he mentioned it only briefly. He said, you know, USB is... is, uh, a way that you know USB drives carried around manually is is a way to do that. Uh, you know, a disadvantage is that it's manual. An advantage is that it's offline. When you disconnect the USB, it's gone, and the bad guys can encrypt the you know what systems they have access to. They don't have access to the USB anymore. So that's you know, manual backups in a sense have both advantages and disadvantages. 
that's a lot of problems with sort of the existing conventional approach to to uh, recovery and backups. Um, you know, again, we're coming back to the 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 magic button. If we want to be able to recover fast from cyber attacks, how do we do that? Well, let, let's divide it to three aspects. Uh, one is compatibility to the OT, and it means backup not just the data, but the entire uh, system. Uh, two uh, is protecting the backup from the attacker and not having them accessible uh, and online. I mean, make uh, offline air gapped uh, backups. Uh, that the attacker cannot penetrate and destroy. And three is the availability. You need uh, them immediately and you need the ability to use them at the moment that uh, you need them. Uh, so uh, I, I, I would say the optimal recover strategy would involve uh, the, the, the make the backups this way that uh, you can uh, have them clean and available uh, when you uh, need them. You say, you know, to be maximally compatible with the OT environment, you've got to back up the entire system. Um, you know, how would you do that? I mean, the vendors, you know, they, they I don't know if they, they don't really like third-party stuff being installed on their machines. Um, you know, sometimes there are, you know, real-time databases that are open and are being updated. What does it mean to take a backup of the, of the entire system? How do you deal with this? It's, it's a good, it's a good uh, uh, point and a good question. Uh, as uh, in the industrial uh, systems, you cannot stop the machine just to make a backup. And you don't want to to wait for uh, the maintenance period uh, to protect your systems. Uh, so actually what we are doing by, uh, when I'm talking about uh, compatibility to the OT, it means first copy the operational system data configuration and the licenses and also make it on the fly. When the uh, system is running and the machine is producing uh, to implement technologies that can take the uh, backups on, on the flight uh, without uh, stopping the uh, system and the software uh, and make the take the data uh, back up the data when while it's used and make sure it is uh, uh, still working and compatible uh, for use later than, we, than you need it. Making a copy of the whole system make, makes sense. But, you know, you, you said there were three aspects. You said, um, you know, the, to protect the backups, they have to be offline. But to use the backups, they have to be online. That, that sounds like a contradiction. Can you, can you explain what's going on there? This is exactly what we are doing in Salvador Technology. Uh, and uh, we implementing our patent of air gap technology to protect the backups. Uh, we have a, a concept of hardware and software combination in our uh, platform. Uh, we have the cyber re recovery unit, we call it CRU, that is always connected to the system. Inside, it includes three NVMe disks, three full copies of the hard disk, including the operational system, data, configuration, and licenses. Uh, at every single moment, it has uh, only one disk accessible, available to the computer uh, to copy all the data. And immediately after the backup, the disk is disconnected. Every day, we switch the disks to make it updated. So uh, three disks, three full copies, different in time. And uh, this means uh, air gap from uh, one side, because it's actually f uh, electronically disconnected from the computer. You cannot see the drive. From the other hand, 
it's always updated every day, full new copy of the entire computer. And additionally, the software that uh, makes the copy of the computer is uh, making a copy in a bootable mode. It means when you need it, you just restart the computer and click a button on, on the device, boot from our device instead of the corrupted uh, hard drive. This way it takes just 30 seconds to recover using our device. Using our uh, device. Cool, because I was going to ask you about, you know, the network impact of doing all these backups over the network, but I guess that's that's not a question that's worth asking. So that's interesting. Um, let me ask you, though, you, you said that inside your unit, you've got three hard drives, you rotate between them daily, uh, they're offline in between backups, that's, that's good. Um, does daily work? I mean, you know, do we not have ransomware scenarios where the ransomware goes in there and takes several days to, you know, encrypt the entire drive and you don't really notice it until half your drive is encrypted? You know, do you have sort of an older, a, a rotation for like a week old, a month old? How, how does that work? Actually, from uh, our experience, uh, most of our customers uh, do use uh, daily backups uh, on our device, uh, but we have also... Backups uh, every two days or uh, even weekly uh, for those organizations that not change too much in the uh, too too much data in the computer. Uh, however, we do realize the need of older backup, and this is why we have three drives. We call them current, previous, and baseline. Current and previous are rotated daily, as you mentioned, and baseline is older uh, version, uh, most probably without the virus. It's uh, old enough to not contain the malware, uh, but updated enough to be relevant and not just a a raw uh, system without the configuration and all the working system. So this is the last line of defense uh, when you run you boot from the current, nothing works, uh, previous, maybe the virus is still there, baseline will be uh, clean. Of course, we also implement uh, additional uh, security uh, capabilities to try and uh, detect uh, anom- anomalies and detect the virus starting to encrypt the, the drive. Uh, and this is additional direction that we are going to uh, with, with our product to help our cost- customers not just to have a backup, but also protected backup from more th- than just uh, air gap. Imagine that you work in a power plant. You're responsible for a half dozen massive boilers. If a cyber attack makes one of these boilers overpressurize and explode, that explosion will most likely kill you. Which protection from that cyber attack would you prefer? Would you like a mechanical relief valve, one that steam pressure forces open when the pressure gets too high so the steam is released harmlessly? Or would you rather have a longer password on the PLC controlling the boilers? The engineering profession has powerful tools to address physical risk from all causes, including cyber risks. But where is the relief valve in the ISO standard or the Industrial 62443 standard? These engineering tools do not exist in cybersecurity standards. Andrew Ginter's latest book, Engineering Grade OT Security, A Manager's Guide, looks at this topic. You can request your free copy at waterfall-security.com slash engineering dash grade dash OT dash security. So Andrew, uh, we're talking here uh, about this this three drive system with the button that you press. What literally are we looking at? Like, can you paint a picture of what his solution is? Short answer is I didn't ask him physically what it looks like. Is there actually a button? Um, but my, my understanding is that it is uh, logically a hard drive. And there are, you know, physically three, he called them NVMEs, you know, non-volatile memory. So it could be hard drive, could be flash, but three persistent stores that are part of the unit. And my understanding is that this hardware unit, um, you know, I'm guessing looks box-like. It looks like, you know, 
what you expect a hard drive to look like. It's sort of a metal box with stuff inside. And you stick it into the computer as if it were another hard drive. It connects to the computer using the same kind of connection as your hard drives use. I see. And so with the, the, the three drive system, um, the, the short term drives for, you know, drive one, drive two, and then the longer term that if I recall you update, like after a month or so, um, the function of that being presumably like if, if your first two preferred drives are corrupted, then you go to the third one, but then that one wouldn't be corrupted because you would have known about it in the time since. Because I know there are a lot of, you know, cyber attacks that occur long before any company knows about it. Actually, let me ask sort of a, a, a question that was left over in my mind from my, my previous answer here. Um, when you use the, one of the backup drives, uh, my understanding is you reboot the machine. And, you know, during the boot sequence, instead of booting from the regular hard drive that's now corrupted, you boot from one of the backups. How do you select the backup? I didn't ask that. You know, is there a physical button on the drive that you have to touch or, you know, on the on the computer that you touch saying, use this drive, use that drive? I don't know. There's, there's different ways you could do it. Um, but once you've rebooted, now the question becomes, uh, you know, can I use the version that I've rebooted from? And uh, my question was, sometimes ransomware sort of takes a long time. If you have 600 gigabytes of stuff on your computer, and most of it's old, you know, old database, old whatever, um, you might not notice that, you know, it's taking three days to encrypt. And if you do a backup after a day, you've backed up a bunch of encrypted stuff. After two days, you've backed up mostly encrypted stuff. On the third day, you discover the problem. You try to restore and you discover that your backups are, you know, one third and two thirds encrypted as well. So, you know, you might be able to get functionality back, but your old data is is gone. This is where you would want to go back to your really old backup. Um, and some attacks, to your point, you know, the uh, Volt Typhoon that, that we heard about recently, uh, you know, living living off the land attack, uh, Chinese intelligence agencies breaking into critical infrastructure, IT networks, um, they hang around for months, you know, up to six months um, was, was reported, but they're not encrypting stuff. And so, you know, if you're encrypting stuff, if it takes a couple of days, um, you're going to notice eventually because your system malfunctions. Um, if you've got one of these sort of attacks where the bad guys are just hanging around, you can, in a sense, uh, recover most of your functionality, even from an old backup, even if that backup is, is you know, in theory compromised by disconnecting those machines from your IT network, from the internet. Now the bad guys, you know, they, they do this stuff by remote control. You can get, in my understanding, basic functionality back as long as the the remote access trojan the rat be it you know software or or you know built in um, cannot be accessed by the by the bad guys anymore so um, in my understanding there really isn't a scenario where ransomware starts encrypting 2 months ago and your month old backup is is partly gone Ransomware tends to work reasonably quickly. I mean, I've, I've heard reports of, of initial contact to completely encrypted in 45 minutes. But even if it takes a couple of days, your, your old backup would still be good. Uh, that was a long, complicated answer. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, and I take your point. Um, the only thing that I would ask, though, is uh, you're right. So the encryption is quick. Um, the Volt Typhoon type actor may stay in your system for a while, but they're not going to um, corrupt your backups, except, you know, we're taking some things for granted in your answer there. Number one, that you know where their malware is, that it's there, and so on and so forth. Um, couldn't it be that, say, you restore from your uh, older backup in, in this case scenario, and there's something planted in there that you don't necessarily find, and then maybe your systems are offline for some period, but you're going to take them online, and then you have a big problem. Again, you've got to look at the attack scenarios. Um, I think, generally speaking, the ability to come back with a, a, a hard drive image that works is valuable. Um, and with ransomware, which is sort of the, the pervasive threat, your hard drive either works or it doesn't. The, the point of encrypting the hard drive is to render the system inoperable so that you will pay the ransom. Um, 
you know, we're mixing we're mixing metaphors when we talk about ransomware corrupting the system and Volt Typhoon sitting there and, and hanging around. Um, so, you know, to me, what I what I see here is an innovation in the space of backups and rapid recovery and you know is your rapid recovery a little bit more involved than press the button and you're done you know maybe you also want to press the button and uh, you know disable internet connectivity on your firewall or you know disable it you know maybe disconnect your firewall so that you can run you know air gapped until the forensic teams are done analyzing what just happened um, you know i think it's valuable having a recovery image that works um, as opposed to uh, recovery images that are completely encrypted and don't work. You've said press a button. Um, the uh, the unit reboots from the uh, the offline backup that was not corrupted. That that all sounds good. Um, what do you do with the corrupted hard drive? Um, because you know, I imagine. I mean, most incident response teams they want to take a forensic image. They want to analyze it later to figure out who were these people who got in, how did they get in. Um, you know, is there and, and eventually, you know, presumably clean up the hard drive so that you can go back to sort of normal operations instead of booting off the backup. Um, what? So what's what's the bigger picture? What do you do? When, you know, once you've pressed the button and you're back, what do you do with that corrupted hard drive? It's a very good point, and uh, we have more and more questions uh, in field uh, about about this um, because forensic part is very important uh, for uh, the response team and understand why uh, we were attacked and. Uh, how to avoid it in the future. So actually, when, when we boot from our device, we uh, make offline the original corrupted hard drive to avoid the vi virus to go uh, to the clean system now. And more than this, you can just remove the hard drive from the computer and keep it for forensic because you boot the system from our external hard drive uh, you not really need the original hard drive, and you can just uh, bring a new one, clean one, and recover to to that one, uh, keeping the corrupted for forensic, for investigation, or any other reason. Uh, by by the way, even if if it's not cyber attack and the hard drive is physically broken, you still can boot from our drive because we replace logically the broken hard drive. Can we go a little deeper? How does it actually work? I mean, um, you uh, inside the unit, you've got three hard drives. You switch, you know, the day, the, the, the time comes and you say, okay, I'm switching back to, you know, one of my offline drives. It's online now. I have to update that drive to make it current do i is there software on the cpu that says oh here uh, here's your 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 image um you know update D do you go somehow directly to the other drive how do you you know when you take your backup how do you do that so the hardware unit is part of the solution and it's absolutely autonomous with its own uh, microprocessors processor to switch between the drives it means the attacker even cannot penetrate and uh, mani manipulate the unit. Uh, to, to make the backups uh, to the currently online uh, drive, and it's only one uh, such drive uh, that is online in every moment, we use uh, a software agent that uh, installed on the computer and using the uh, computer CPU, actually access the original drive and copy the data in the background uh, to our uh, our drive. Uh, so we, we do use the agent software for this. Uh, and uh, this may sound like a problem for uh, some of um, OT companies uh, using uh, vendors that uh, not allow installing anything to the, on, on the computer. And uh, uh, we, we're using here interesting approach 
of agentless version of our software. It's still using the CPU of the computer, but no, no nothing installed on the uh, computer, not impacts the system and not impact the warranty uh, of the vendor of the computer. Uh, to, to, to do this, uh, we placed the additional small drive inside our unit. The software runs from, from this uh, external uh, drive. Uh, so as, as I mentioned, nothing installed in the computer, no traces on the systems system. Uh, we use just the CPU power to make the copy from the destination, the original drive to our external uh, unit. Uh, and this successful approach that solves um, a, a lot of uh, problems with the customers that cannot use any other backup systems uh, because they just cannot install the agent. When I'm backing up my laptop, I've got a, a terabyte drive here. Um, the laptop slows down a little. When you know, and and historically, um, you know, antivirus was always a problem on industrial systems because a full scan of the hard drive would pull the whole drive into memory and would analyze it all with the, the antivirus and it would slow things down so badly that the often the control system would malfunction. Um, how do you how do you throttle this? What what do you do to you know uh, control the impact on the control system while you're taking a backup? So the antivirus issue is that it should scan every moment and every uh, movement in the in the data uh, of the computer. In our case, uh, we can uh, backup it when the computer is not using the full power. So uh, the back backup can take ten minutes. It can take two hours. And it not impact the quality of the backup. It not impact uh, the computer as well. So we adapt our uh, usage of the uh, CPU and RAM to uh, minimum, not to harm uh, the resources of the computer. And as we know, in OT, the computers are not the strongest. Uh, so unlike antivirus. As, it, uh, as I mentioned, uh, must be uh, track every movement. We can slow down when the computer is a bit uh, loaded and adapt uh, our process to the OT world. You've got product in this arena. Um, you know, we've we've talked about how it works. I assume you've got a management system as well, so you can you know reach out and configure these things, and you know find out if there's I don't know problems with with backups on one machine or another. Whenever there's a problem, you know people want to know about it because backups are important. Can you talk about about what you've got? It's a as a management system is a part of our uh, platform, and actually it's uh, maybe the most useful part on the daily basis. Uh, when the hardware unit always connected, you not uh, do, not, do not touch it on a daily basis, and the software make copy on the background, so the user even cannot see the backups. It's just done in the background. So to monitor everything and to make sure everything working, we built. Uh, a, a web portal that is accessible from the cloud if the user has have uh, access uh, to the cloud or on-prem the same system on-prem to monitor the uh, backups and the statuses it means all the unit if it's one two dozen or hundred of units uh, installed, you see all of them in one centralized system. What you can see is the health of the backups. If they done correctly, start, stopped correctly, fin finished correctly. Uh, if something happens with the hardware unit, with the software, uh, also if we detected some malicious uh, activity in the system, we want to stop our backup 
in the OT you cannot stop the the process you cannot stop the machine but we can stop our backups and keep the clean environment once we detect uh, an anomaly and here comes the uh, the management system that alerts the user by, by email by uh, sms uh, integration to SOC to sim to show the user a full status full image of what's going on in the uh, in the uh, in the production with the backups. Uh, in addition, uh, I want to mention here a cooperation. Uh, we, we are not detection company, so we are not focusing on detect the virus, but we do have cooperation with other uh, system, uh, other, other ven vendors uh, that do have uh, detection of anomalies, of uh, malwares, uh, uh, and uh, we have cooperation with uh, some of uh, these companies to build a mutual product when they detect some malicious activity or some anomaly, they can inform us and we can stop the backups uh, again to protect them from the attacker, to not copy the virus, not to... Uh, copies encrypted data and this way uh, just destroys the backups uh, so we do everything to make sure you have a recovery point and fast ability to continue the operations so andrew alex has done a uh, pretty thorough job of explaining this backup system to us how does it compare with the rest of the industry the other kinds of systems that you've come across in your time well he talked about um you know manually taking usbs around the um the systems that i recall seeing most frequently are network based um and you know, that was my question backing up. You know, I was going to ask a question about backing up across the network and then discovered that, you know, the question made no sense. He's not backing up across the network. But um, if you're backing up across the OT network, um, you're putting load, you know, communications load on the network and potentially slowing down important communications. And so um, in my experience, most people do, if they do backups, they do it over the network. Um, if uh, throughput is a problem, they will, you know, in my experience, tend to run a parallel network, uh, call it an admin network. This is the network they use for security updates, you know, after they've been tested ad nauseum. This is the network they use for, um, you know, alerts going to their security monitoring system. This is the network they use for backups. And in a sense, nobody cares how heavily loaded that admin network is because, the real-time communication is happening on uh, on a different network. Um, but, you know, to Alex's point, uh, let's say you want, you've got, I don't know, a, a thousand machines in a server room and you want, it, you want them backed up to, I don't know, two or three backup servers. Um, you're going to go from one machine to the other and it's going to take you an hour or an hour and a half to back up, uh, you know, a half terabyte of data from each of these machines, even if you're going across a, a fast network. Um, which means if you ever need to recover um, and you press a button and say restore, you're going to go around one machine at a time and restore because if you're going to restore a half gigabyte of data or sorry, a half terabyte of data, it's going to take you some time. Um, and, you know, so you don't have the, you know, press a button, reboot now, here you go. That's sort of the, the, uh, the innovation, the benefit here. Um, and, as I said, you know, it's probably worse than that. Um, like I said, the uh, the data point, the public data point from Colonial, and they it was an IT network. They had all of the IT infrastructure behind them. It still took them five and a half days to recover. Um, so, yeah, the, you know, having the, the ability to do this sort of really quickly, um, to me, has real benefit when, you know, you have a large investment in a physical process that you need to bring back online because it's billions of dollars sitting idle there uh, as long as it's down. Industrial vendors like, you know, Honeywell and Siemens and, and ABB, uh, that these vendors, um, you know, Schneider Electric, um, 
many of their products already have the option for, let's call it high availability, um, so that uh, you know, no single point of hardware failure will cause the system to to become impaired. They have you know systems that are clustered. They have multiple hard drives. They have rated hard drives. These are all sort of standard options. Um, it sounds to me like what you've got here is something that's a logical standard option on lots of different control systems. Um, you know. You've got the, the, instead of saying, I've got a rated hard drive so that if the hard drive fails, the system just keeps going. What you've got here is multiple hard drives, not configured in a RAID, but configured in a backup configuration so that if a hard drive fails, you can recover. So that if you're compromised, you can recover. This sounds like, in a sense, a, a standard thing that most control system vendors, you know, looking at, at cybersecurity are, are, I'm guessing they're going to be interested. Are you talking to these people? You know, can you, can you talk about, about, you know, sort of how this fits into, into the big picture of control systems? Absolutely. We are in contact uh, with uh, all of them or most of them uh, to, uh, to integrate our uh, solution as a standard, as you mentioned, the RAID systems and uh, multiple disks. Uh, is this is uh, what's called uh, the, the DR, disaster recovery, uh, and more recovery from uh, functionality and the physical damage. That is, that is great, and, and we comp- comp- uh, complement this with cyber resilience uh, solution. So the, uh, our goal is uh, to uh, come to the customer uh, together with this vendor uh, and provide full solution uh, with uh, the HMI or SCADA machine uh, having the recovery unit built in. We even started to uh, make POCs with uh, some of these vendors to integrate the recovery unit inside the computer to provide the users, the computer, with the uh, cyber recovery capabilities inside. Um, this is more strategic and long processes that we established, uh, but uh, this is part of our strategy uh, to capture the uh, Field of cyber resilience and provide provide this solution to to the OT something that did not yet exist in the, in the OT world. We've talked about computers. We've talked about HMI. Um, you know, the dominant operating system, the dominant HMI platform in the industry is Windows. So you know, I'm assuming that we've been talking about Windows here. Um, do you have, you know, are you looking at, at sort of the bigger picture? Do you have stuff for, I don't know, Linux? You know, Linux is not uh, so popular today in, in OT. Uh, maybe it will be in the future. So we do have it in our uh, roadmap, but not, not in, in our focus currently. Uh, we support most of the Windows environments, uh, even started to support uh, Windows XP, Unfortunately, it's uh, very popular and no protection for this. So we decided to support uh, Windows XP. We support uh, Windows 7 and 10 and 11 and Windows servers. Uh, But uh, recently we discovered that uh, more and more OT organizations shifts to ESXi. Uh, and uh, this kind of gap uh, today, is, is the reason is working on more v- virtual uh, systems in the manufacturing floor. Uh, we see more and more systems like this in field. Uh, so uh, we included it uh, in our roadmap uh, to uh, help our customers. It's uh, not uh, an easy task to boot ESXi and run it immediately. So we're working on this. 
Uh, and actually see first results, uh, I would expect it uh, to, to, to have uh, some solution for this in a couple of uh, months uh, as we see growing need for this uh, environment. Cool. Well, you know, thank you, Alex, for for joining us. This has been tremendous. I've learned something. Um, you know, before we let you go, can you sum up for us what uh, you know? What should we be thinking about to be to be you know looking at the the problem of recovery the right way? First of all, thank you for uh, having me. Uh, to summarize, I would like to recommend uh, using air gap technology to protect uh, the data, uh, involve the OT people into the cyber. Let them understand the risk and be part of the cyber resilience team, the, the cyber resilience process, and educate them. Uh, we in Salvador have uh, vast experience with the cyber attack recovery, uh, and uh, I will be happy to answer any question uh, or any requirement. Uh, you can reach me by LinkedIn, by our website, or by email. Uh, we are a very responsive team and we'll be happy to consult on any resilience question. Andrew, it looks like that does it for your interview. Uh, do you have any final thoughts that you might want to take us out with today? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, reflecting on the episode, um, it occurs to me that this is sort of yet another uh, example of sort of the the uh, the difference between security requirements and call it sort of traditional reliability requirements i mean one of the goals of cybersecurity is to you know assure uh, you know reliable operation to keep critical infrastructures and you know large investments producing um, and uh, you know alex mentioned earlier raid drives uh, you know raids are examples of sort of continuous online redundancy. If any one of the drives, if smoke rises out of any one of the drives in the RAID, the RAID just keeps going. I mean, the, the user doesn't even notice. They get an alert saying, hey, you should fix this. One of your drives failed. But it just keeps going. Security is different. With, with uh, sort of traditional reliability, um, you assume sort of random equipment failures. You assume random failures. Um, with security, if you corrupt the raid you've corrupted the entire raid there is nothing left um and so you know this is sort of another example of where security requirements are different from traditional reliability requirements um you have to take into account that that you know the the failures induced by a cyber attack are going to be sort of simultaneous across a large swath of infrastructure. And you need a different system to recover from those. And here's a system I'd never heard of. You know, here's a system where uh, a lot of the time, you know, you can reboot and you're off and running again, um, which is which is tremendous. So, uh, you know, good, good job to these folks. And and I hope this becomes a, a standard feature in a lot of the, the infrastructure that we rely on going forward. Well, thank you to Alex Yevtushenko for elucidating all this for us. And Andrew, as always, thank you for speaking with me. It's always a pleasure. Thank you, Nate. This has been the Industrial Security Podcast from Waterfall. Thanks to everyone out there listening. <laughs>